Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the pack at Hacky Village at Def Con 25 in Las Vegas, Nevada. First and foremost, on a personal note, we cannot thank you enough for all the support and for your contributions for all these years. Um, if it wasn't for all of you and for your support, we would not be here. We're such a big village and such a strong support. So we are very, very, very grateful for that. The Wall Chief's mission is and has always been on security awareness. This year, the Packet Hacking Village have a number of events and learning opportunities, including the venerable Hacker Detective, which is a Neapolitan, and Captain of Hackets. We also have the fantastic uh, slate of DJs to keep the village entertained. Okay? Even nice and entertained and lively. The Cheer Cheap City and Honey Pots are back. We are also very excited that we have something new in store for this year. Hands-on workshops. That there is a tremendous demand for training and continuing education in this field. We hope that you will take advantage of the many opportunities here at the Packet Hacking Village and ultimately at DEF CON to learn, to collaborate, and to be inspired. And of course, here we are at the speaker workshops. This is a very special year for this event, the speaker work workshop, as part of Packet Hacking Village, as this is the fifth anniversary of the speaker workshops. We are going to kick it off right off the bat with a very, very special keynote. Dan Gear said in this keynote at Black Hat 2014, and I quote, Cybersecurity security is now a riveting concern, a top issue in many venues more important than this one. For as Matt Blaze said bluntly at the 11th hole last year, 2016, in New York City, and I quote, we are now in a national security crisis, cybersecurity crisis. So what does this have to do with the keynote this morning? There are many, now many people starting to enter or study cybersecurity, which is very, very welcoming to see. However, the body of knowledge is now too deep and intimidating to grasp and history can be easily forgotten. Now, how did we get into this mess in the first place? In May of 1998, a group of hackers testified in front of a panel of U.S. Senators. The hacker group was Block, based out of Boston, Massachusetts. One of the members of Block who testified was well on, first by software. Block warned that the internet, the software, and the hardware are not safe and security is an afterthought. Their warning was a disaster foretold, and as we all know, tragically ignored. On a side note, please read the wonderful Washington Post article, well, a disaster foretold and ignored. And their warning and efforts also paved way for many of our careers and lifestyles in this field, including mine. And why many of us are here today at DEFCON. It is my fantastic honor to introduce you all to the keynote speaker this morning at your Copper Speaker Workshop, Rich White Hall. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for that very warm, very warm welcome. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking today. Uh, my first time speaking at the Pack and Hacking Village. And, uh, you know, I, I, since it was the 25th anniversary of DEF CON, I've been coming since DEF CON 4. I think I missed a few along the way, but uh, um, I thought, you know, why not have a bit of a retrospective to talk about how we, how we got here and what an impact uh, hackers had on the, on the security industry and really made the security industry what it is today. It would be very, very different um, if it wasn't for the input of people who are doing independent research um, and taking that hacker mindset. So I'll, I'll start off where Ming started off here with uh, 
this was this was uh, the picture of the gang of us um, testifying before the Senate in uh, May 1998. Um, if you can't recognize me, my hair is a little different. Still have the goatee. I was a little bigger back then, but uh, you might probably can't see it. But on the uh, the placards there in the front, you can see Tan, Ping, Ping, Mudge, Well Pond, Space Road, and. Uh, there's kind of an interesting aspect to this is um, when we, we got invited to come speak, we said, well, we will only do it under our, our hacker aliases. Uh, and they said, why? why? And they said, because we have day jobs. And back in 1998, if you were you know, called a hacker and you had you know, hands-on keyboards at some IT, in an IT uh, admin, admin responsibility, they might say, we don't want someone like that with that kind of responsibility. You might, you might lose your job, you know? And uh, so that's, that was the mindset back then because it hadn't changed yet. I don't think you, you, you'd have that today if you said, hey, I, I call myself a hacker and I go to DEF CON. They'd probably say, hey, we need to, we need to give you more responsibility, right? <laughs> uh, but back then, it, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that. But how did we get to this point? You know, this is around 1998. Things had to happen before that, before we got invited. And uh, what, what I like to say is, we made trouble, right? We got noticed. And how did we do that? We made people upset, right? We didn't break the law, as far as I can talk about today. No, we didn't, we didn't. Um, but we, we did make people upset, right? People didn't like the idea of full disclosure. You know, Microsoft really didn't like that. They didn't like us putting out uh, documentation how their password storage mechanism sucks. They didn't like that because then all their customers, including you know banks and the DOD, would say, Microsoft, your software is insecure. It sucks. Fix it. And that costs them money. And it makes them look bad. Um, so uh, by causing trouble and causing pain for other organizations, we actually raised a lot of awareness to the kind of problems um, that were out there. And, and we kind of stumbled upon this. I can't say that there was, there was uh, a, uh, a master plan. We just started taking our research and instead of just sort of posting it to bug track and um, you know, being very academic about it, we decided that we really should be more consumer advocate focused. We should take the research, and instead of being just pure technical research, we should think of it as, you know, vendors are, are doing bad things that are harming consumers, right? And that really started around 95 or so, and it, it changed it from like, oh, I know how to break into your system, to, wait a minute, the vendors are shipping code that is causing this problem for their customers. And I, I think that was a, that was a big a, a big sort of paradigm shift um, that uh, caused hackers to be that you know that force that was siding with sort of siding with the user right you fight for the user you know was that the Tron line um, and so by sort of causing trouble um, we got noticed and that is how the, the Senate came to us saying you know you guys. You guys have an angle on this that's different than what we're hearing from the big vendors. It's different than what we're hearing from the government accounting office, which is really just going through a checklist saying you didn't configure this correctly, you didn't configure this correctly. And that's how the government thought about it. And, and, and we, we basically said, hey, the vendors can do better. They can ship things that are secure by default. They can ship things that aren't, aren't as broken. Um, the problem was the vendors didn't know how to do that yet, but we'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So now I just want to go back to what the computer security <coughs> was before hackers came onto the scene and started to inject themselves into the dialogue. Um, we had the, the famous orange book, Common Criteria, which was uh, basically a lot of things that you should do to build a secure system. You know, you need all those features and functionality, you need your encryption, your authorization, uh, authorization, you need your logging and your auditing and all of that. Um, but it left out, it left out the 
fact that there could be mistakes in the software, that the engineers might actually make mistakes. That was, that, they didn't even think about that. It's not in there. This is not in that book at all. Who has software that has bugs in it? Software has always had bugs in it, yet this was completely ignored in the Orange Book. It's like, it's like the software was perfect. You'd have great security if you followed the Orange Book if you made perfect software. Well, we all know that doesn't exist, right? So um, that was just a, a gaping, gaping, gaping huge hole that hackers came on the scene and said, you guys have this gaping hole in the way you're building systems. You're building systems with bugs in them. And we're going to exploit those bugs, and we're going to bypass all of your controls. Um, the other, the other uh, aspect of the way computer security was, was thought of was, was CERT. And uh, CERT was formed after the Morris worm in order to, you know, basically put information out there when, they knew, when there was attacks that happened. The problem was this was really a government funded and a government organized with a government mindset. And, and the mindset back then was sort of like the intelligence communities today is like, yeah, we'll hoover up a lot of information, we'll analyze it, and then we'll give out the information to you that we think you should have. Right? So basically CERT was they wanted to be in control of vulnerability information, weaknesses in, in software, uh, weaknesses in configuration. They wanted to be in control and manage how the public knew about weaknesses. So if you reported something to CERT in 1993, it might just go into a black hole and they might stop communicating with you. They said, hey, we're the good guys. Send the information to us and we'll make sure that security gets better. But what we found out was we would send them information and we didn't know what, went, what happened to it. We didn't even know if they contacted the vendor. We don't even know if the vendor patched the software or what patch was available to fix the issue we might have told them. So it was a total black hole and it didn't work. So that government mindset of closed controlled information um, just doesn't work when it comes to, uh, comes to securing our, our world. So in 1993, I was just starting to get involved with the loft at that time and I got introduced to this paper, Improving the Security of Your Site by Breaking Into It. And to me, this was a, a, a seminal paper um, if you've never read it, go out there and read it because this is what really, they really codified really how, how the hacker mindset can be used to secure systems. Basically what this paper said was, why don't you study how your systems are being compromised, See, look at the technique they're using to compromise the system, and then basically test all your other systems to see if they have that problem. I mean, it seems completely obvious today, right? But back in 1993, this was actually a new concept. People who did security for a corporate network did not do this. They didn't do this at all. And so um, what, what Dan Farmer and Weetzi Venema did was they started collecting information about how systems were compromised. It was a trust violation with, you know, a, a tr a, a exploiting trust with our hosts. Was it a weak password? Um, was it, was it a, a well-known bug? And they started to script these up and um, put, them, put them together. And um, what they really did was they made information security a participatory sport. There was this give and take between the attacker and the defender, where the attacker learns, the defender can learn from the attacker. And um, so studying the way attackers behave or simulating how an attack might happen or practicing red teaming, right, um, were all things that hackers brought to the table. And they made security an active participatory uh, activity as opposed to a static configure, configuration of features and, and technology. Um, so around this time, we started to see the first the first hacker tools. You know, we have so many tools today, it's completely awesome how many people write great tools and put them out there. But these are some of the very first ones um, that, that came to the table. Um, you know, I, 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 I was looking sort of for the, what was the first, you know, hacker mindset kind of tool, and I think it really was Crack by Alec Muffet. He came up with the idea that um, you could test the strength of your passwords and see if they're guessable. 
right? It makes perfect sense, right? Like, why not see if your users are using weak passwords and tell them to fix it, right? But again, it takes that hacker mindset to do that. The normal security person's mindset didn't do that. It took the ha hacker mindset to kind of change that. And this was a radical notion back then. Again, it seems completely obvious today, but it really was a radical notion. It was so radical that Randall Schwartz, who was assistant administrator at Intel, got fired for running crack on the systems that he was responsible for. He was responsible for the security of the system. He ran crack because he had read about the tool, he understood it, it made sense. I'm gonna see if any of my users are using uh, guessable passwords. And someone caught him running this process and doing this and he, he got fired and charged with a felony for running a, a security tool, a, a hacker tool, right? It wasn't considered a security tool. Um, the next example here is a program called Satan that Dan Farmer and Weetzy Venema wrote. And they were automating all the things that they were learning from attackers. Like I was saying, you know, secure your network by breaking into it. They said, why don't we automate that? And why don't we script it up? So uh, Dan um, wrote this tool and released it, and he called it Satan. I'm not sure exactly what a system administrator toolkit or something like that. And uh, once he released it, he got fired from his job at SGI. He was, uh, he was a programmer at SGI, and they saw that he released a hacker tool, and they just fired him. They said, we can't have a hacker working at our company that's releasing these bad hacker tools. This was really the first vulnerability scanner. Um, and uh, now it's a huge market. It's a standard thing that you do. But there was someone who had to write the first one, and the, the person who wrote the first one got fired. So I, I think some of the theme that I'm trying to bring across is progress is made by people who are making trouble. They're doing things that other people don't like. It's not illegal but they, they just don't like it. They don't like the idea that these tools are out there that can break into their system because they don't understand. Um, and you know, over the past you know, 20 years, we've gotten more people to understand, but there's still things that we have to do to make trouble to keep pushing, pushing the envelope. Um, and then Hobbit wrote um, Netcat in 1996, um, which if you haven't played with Netcat, at least read the README file. It, it really is, uh, I mean, I'm sure here people at the Packet Hacking Village have played with Netcat, but the README file is, is just an awesome um, look into the mind of someone deconstructing TCP IP and sockets. As far as I know, no one's been fired directly for using Netcat, but who, it's, things could still happen. And then on the information resources side, who was sharing the information about all, this, all these issues, how attackers were working? It was the hacker community. It was BugTrack, which started in 1993, the same year that DEF CON started in 1993. And, and that, that really was the birth of a new form of information sharing that wasn't controlled by the government, wasn't controlled by CERT. It was people talking to other people. And that's, that's really what started the openness that we need to, uh, to, secure, to secure our environment. The, the next step in this was hackers starting to write commercial software. This was hackers sort of moving into the commercial space. And I, I think really one of the first, the first uh, commercial software written by a hacker was uh, the Internet Security Scanner by, uh, by Chris Klaus. And uh, we at the loft started to think, hey, we could make a piece of software that is targeted at system administrators. You know, most, most you know, tools that hackers write for other hackers are, are command line tools. You know, Alec Muffet's crack was a command line tool. What we learned was Windows, Windows NT administrators can't use that, right? So we, 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 uh, we open sourced our command line version, but we built a, a version with the GUI um, so that actual Windows NT administrators could use it, and, and, we, and we sold that. And we said, hey, wait a minute, we can actually make money um, you know, building the tools to help secure systems. So this, again, was another change of, of, of just becoming more of the security industry at the time. And then around um, 1998, um, 
we started to uh, really interface with Microsoft, and we really started to tell Microsoft what was wrong with their networking protocols, what was wrong with the way that you were building things. And we came up with the notion, much like um, uh, Dan Farmer and, and Wheatsey's uh, notion of improving your network by breaking into it, we said, well, wait a minute, what about improving the security of a product by breaking into it. So instead of looking at the whole network and finding the weaknesses in the network, why not look at isolate, look at one piece of software, put that software in a, in a lab environment with your debugger, your, your packet capture, and, you know, and uh, other, other reverse engineering tools, and start to think, hey, we can actually secure software by trying to break into the software. So to me, this was sort of the beginning of, of the process that, we, that a lot of companies use today to actually try to secure their software before they ship their software to their, to, to their customers. But at the same time, the security industry still isn't, isn't, isn't woken up. If you were, if you were uh, working and doing security in like 1998, 1999, um, it, they're still doing this. They're selling security features. That, that's, that's the only thing that they knew how to do to secure a network or, or selling compliance. And we all know that this is just gets bypassed, right? You just bypass all those things and you ignore all the compliance issues, right? Like you don't even, you don't even look at the book and say, hey, let's see if they check this box. I'm going to attack and see if they check that box. That's just not how the hacker mindset works. It's, it's, it's so compliance is completely orthogonal to the, pro to the hacker process. So in 2000, um, we decided to basically, a lot of people called it selling out. And this is what we did at the loft. We said, let's take all the things we are, we're doing here, the tools we're building, the processes we're using to reverse engineer software, to pen test networks, Let's see if we can just do this as a business. And uh, this, you know, the, the headlines were, were, were pretty, it, it, you know, uh, you know, we're going to use good hackers to, to fight, fight the bad hackers. Um, you know, people like to put things into, into simple, easy boxes, right, for the, for the general public. But the idea was that uh, we were going to take all the things that we were doing um, that we had sort of um, created over the last few years, and we were going to sell those as services um, to customers. So, I don't think we were the you know the, the first you know company to do do commercial pen testing, um, but it, it definitely put it on the map that uh, that that you could use these techniques to secure your network and secure your software. So, some of the things that we different did different that other security consultancies. Uh, weren't doing at the time, but seemed totally normal today. This was completely new. We conducted our own vulnerability research. It was a consultant consultancy that had people going out and pen testing, and people back at back at that back at the office um, building tools and doing uh, research. Um, and uh, we came up with the concept of we can help you secure your application by breaking into it for you and telling you how we did it. Um, and then other companies started to follow. You probably have heard of Garden, went, went to VeriSign, Foundstone, uh, went to McAfee. I think McAfee still calls their, uh, their, their adversarial um, security services Foundstone. And then shortly after that, we had all kinds of worms that were, that were affecting Microsoft, excuse me, Microsoft products. Code Red, SQL Slammer. I mean, basically, uh, it, it, was, it was pretty much of a, dis a disaster. If you were an, 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 a Windows NT admin or Windows 2000 admin in 2002, you were like patching IIS like on a monthly basis just so you didn't get wormed, a worm attack. It was really bad. So Bill Gates came out with the trusted computing memo. And he said, um, we're going to stop everything. We're going to stop building software the way we used to build it. We're going to train all of our engineers on writing secure software because they, they had a book, um, Writing Secure Code, I think it's called. We're going to train them on, on that. 
and then we're going to build secure software. Um, the problem was they all read the book and they all got the training and then they went back to their desks and they still didn't know how to build secure software. They thought they could do it, but they couldn't. They didn't, they didn't have the capability of, of, uh, of making sure that the software they were releasing was actually secure because there was nothing in their, in their um, they had secure, co secure coding guidelines, but there was nothing in their process which was adversarial in nature. There was no process of testing. There was no process of attacking. So they, they, they didn't actually know how to write secure software. So what did Microsoft do? They hired a company started by hackers to come and teach them how to secure their software. So Microsoft hired at stake. I was there for months at a time, um, helping them write, re completely rewrite IIS, helping them uh, secure Exchange, SQL, SQL Server. Um, we taught them how to threat model. They had no concept of threat modeling at the time. You know, Microsoft likes to talk about how you know, they have Stride and they have all these threat modeling standards. They learned it from hackers. Hackers taught them how to do that. What was the hacker mindset for trying to break into a piece of software? So that, this came from hackers. They didn't, they didn't understand exploiting heap overflows. Their engineers just didn't, didn't get it. We had to teach them that because they weren't, they, uh, they weren't gonna fix buffer overflows on the heap because they didn't think it was exploitable. They didn't have any concept of, of fuzzing software. Uh, Dave Itell, who's now at, uh, um, founder of Immunity, wrote the spike fuzzer while on the, I, uh, right, while on the Microsoft campus because he wanted to fuzz, um, fuzz, fuzz the software that we were testing for Microsoft, and he said, let me, well, let me write a, a general purpose fuzzer called Spike, and then he later uh, open sourced it. One kind of funny, funny aspect of this was Dave wanted to do this in using his Linux laptop, and um, Microsoft explicitly said, you can't bring a Linux laptop onto the Microsoft campus. He, we had to get special permission from like some senior vice president and it had to only be in this room and it was tightly controlled. They were afraid that like if a little of that software, that GPL software somehow got onto the Microsoft network, they would just get, their lawyers had them so scared that like all their software would be GPL'd. It was like the GPL virus is what they called it and they thought that using a Linux laptop was a really scary thing. You know, now it's, now, you know, Azure, you know, you can spin up Linux boxes, right? So they finally, it's taken them a long time to get over it. Um, we taught them how to do things like find the attack surface. We would do threat modeling with the engineers and they would tell us about all the inputs into the program, what other uh, components it talked to. And then we would run something like uh, SysInternals Process Explorer and we'd be like, you didn't mention this name pipe. You know, you didn't mention that it read, read from this file. And the people who built the software didn't actually understand how their software worked because they were calling into libraries that were doing things that they didn't understand. So we taught them how to go to the ground truth to actually look at what the software was doing, right? Take a reverse engineering process. They could only think with a forward engineering process. And so they didn't even, the engineers at Microsoft didn't even know how their software worked. Um, and so we taught them how, how, to, how to do that. It's really interesting that Microsoft actually ended up buying the, the, the company that made uh, SysInternals. Um, and then, then this was sort of finally, you know, we look at the Microsoft SDLC as the standard. They like to say, we, we, we have a great process for building software uh, securely. And they, uh, they were the main contributors to ISO 27. 34, which is, a, is the process for building software. Where did they learn most of the stuff that's in there? They learned it from hackers. So we could say that if you think your software is more secure today than it was you know, 15 years ago, it's because hackers taught software vendors how to secure their software. So you know, basically, I, I take this to about 2003 or so, where sort of the modern era of security um, and building software started and, and, and down to, to where we are today. So penetration testing 
once was a scary thing that you hired hackers for and you know you had to get special permission for it it's now a requirement right if you're if you're a financial services you have some certain compliance you need to pen test your applications right so now it's a requirement um, people have a product security response team to communicate with hackers right um, and develop developers are using hacker techniques as they build the software to test it in order to make sure that that software is secure. So today we really do have securing your product by trying to, trying to, trying to break into it. And I'm also happy to say that bug bounties um, came because the idea of someone poking around in your software and informing you about it became a legitimate good thing that companies wanted to reward. So this is really full circle from 20 years ago when if you, you know, there, there were people um, that would report bugs and they would be threatened, like Mike Lynn was threatened uh, from Cisco, um, and uh, Dmitry Skylarov was threatened, um, well, arrested because of, from, uh, he, was, he, he came to DEF CON about uh, 15 years ago, he was arrested because he was gonna talk about bugs in DRM. Um, so we've come full circle from people notifying uh, of, of, of vulnerabilities and you know potentially getting arrested to today it's a you know it's all it's all a good thing so now I want to take us to t today and uh, where, 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 where have we come where have we come today you know it still looks pretty bad out there I mean if you see what what the Petya uh, ransomware worm was able to do on modern you know modern networks huge companies like Maersk and uh, FedEx uh, the Ukrainian government, um, it's still probably, it's still pretty bad out there, right? The really crazy thing is nation states are pretending to be hackers. I don't know for sure if a nation state, um, what released uh, Petya or not Petya, what you want to call it, but I find it very interesting that whatever their motives and what they were trying to do, they were trying to look like criminal hackers, right? So this is now, we, we've, we've come to this, this point that this is just a part, the, the, uh, even people that are you know, doing offensive operations for governments, they want to look like us, right? They want to look like the people that go to DEF CON. They, they think that, that's, a, that, that that's, how you, that's how you hide yourself. And today, hackers are insiders, right? We could be sellouts, we could be insiders, whatever you want to call it. I put the names of some of the companies up here that people have disclosed. I know that the three other guys up there, I know where they work, but they, they like to keep it a little bit, a little bit on the down low. Some people are still really paranoid. Um, but uh, hackers, hackers are insiders. You know, Mudge uh, worked for DARPA. You know, he was a government employee working for DARPA, funding, uh, using his insider position for uh, to to use DARPA funds to fund uh, hacker um, style projects like Charlie Miller and Chris Velasek hacking the Jeep was funded um, through through DARPA. So now that we're insiders, we're really in powerful positions to actually change, you know, change things, um, and that's that's a good thing. You know, it was basically uh, Windows Snyder and Katie Masuris who over time got Microsoft to even do a bug bounty program. Right, and they, they, they came from the hacker community. And we all know insiders are more powerful, right? But we're getting old, right? We're old insiders, right? Uh, we need the next generation to keep doing what, what we did, right? We need people to still keep making trouble. And I do still, pe still see people out there making trouble. Um, I don't know, you, most people have probably heard of Justine Bone and her company MedSec, which caused a lot of trouble for St. Jude medical devices by selling their, their research around how their pacemaker had vulnerabilities that could kill someone, selling their research to a hedge fund that shorted the stock. That's making trouble, that's trying to change things up. They didn't do anything illegal, right? They, there is a lawsuit out there, but I think they'll probably be okay. Um, and they brought a new mindset into thinking about how, should we, how can we fix the market around uh, cybersecurity. For a long time, it's been a vendor-customer relationship where the vendor decides um, 
how much security they're going to put in their products, and the consumers have no visibility into it. And you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a lemon market, right? Like you, you, the consumer has no power over making their world a more secure place. In, in in general, the average person. And and what MedSec did was by bringing in the investor community, brought in another party. They brought in the owners of the companies, the investors who own parts of these public companies, and brought them to the table, and woke them up to say, hey, maybe the security of these products is going to change how much money I make with this company. So it's not the people who are the employees of the company that you know, were, were necessary in control. Now what MedSec did was brought in this other party, the investor community, and we're starting to see more of that now. Ponemon Institute uh, came out with a report showing how stocks dip after major vulnerabilities are announced. And the, the study broke down how much it dipped and for how long the stock dipped. And it turned out that companies that had a very good security, uh, mature security posture and had a really good response, their stock dipped uh, less, half as much, and for half as much time. Whereas companies that were very not, uh, immature from a security perspective and had a really bad response, their stock dipped twice as much and lasted twice as longer. My analysis on that is the investor community say, sees the vulnerability from the mature company as you know, uh, a black swan, right? It's something that, oh, it happened, it happens to everybody, but it's not going to be a regularly occurring event. But when it happens to a company that doesn't have a good response and can't talk about how they're securing their software, the investor community thinks, well, oh, this is going to happen again and again and again. This is actually going to damage the brand and hurt the company. So we're starting to get the investors that own these companies to think about security. So it's still early days, but I, I think that that's an interesting uh, new, new angle. So what I want to you know, ask you to do is to make me nervous. I want you to go out there and do something. I don't want you to break the law, but I want you to do something that after you do it, I say, I don't know if that's a good idea. That was my reaction to med when I first saw the MedSec uh, incident. I said, really, are we going to go down this path? This is not going to, this is going to tarnish the research community. This is going to make hackers look bad. And then I thought about it and I said, maybe, maybe we should give this a chance. Maybe we should let this play out. Maybe there's some big benefit down the road to this. Someone's trying something. But it made me nervous at the beginning. It really did. And so that's my call to you, is to do something that makes me nervous. Because I've been doing this a long time. I've seen a lot. I made other people nervous. But do something that makes me nervous. And I think that will be pushing the envelope. So I just want to finish here with something a little bit practical um, and a way that we all can influence our, the organizations we're in is the concept of security champions. Now, I'm in the application security business. Um, I help companies build secure software. And part of it is to build that security culture. The security team can't do it all. You know, pen testers can't do it all. Hackers can't do it all. We have to enlist the masses. We have to get them to understand the security mindset. And so the notion of security champion is, you know, Take the example of a, a company that builds software. In every development team or every scrum team in that company, identify an individual who has the aptitude and the interest and in maybe learning a little bit more ab about security. So there's, there's software developers, their day job. Get them interested in, 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 in security. Give them some extra training. Uh, you know, do some reverse engineering with them. Uh, do a capture the flag exercise with them. Get them interested in security. And if you can get you know, uh, one person in each development team interested in security, it has a huge impact across the organization. Because there's just not enough security people, there's, and there's a lot of people building software out there. And I think you can take this to other places to educate people. So I think that is something that we all have a responsibility to do where we work or in our lives, is, is to educate. Uh, because it, it, it can't be an us, us and them, you know. I know it's called the wall of sheep, and then there's a bunch of sheep out there, and then there's the wolves, right? But it'd be great if we could get some, some of those sheep more educated. 
So um, with that, uh, I'm going to end, end it there. There's my contact info if you want to uh, contact me. I don't know, Ming, if I went over time, if we have any time for questions. We do have time for a few questions. And if you have a question for Chris, and please have, you know, we definitely welcome you because this is a fantastic opportunity right now. Uh, the mic is all yours. Hey, good, good morning. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Chris, my name's David. I'm from New York. Um, I just, I wanted to ask you, uh, I've, I've read um, news articles that talk about how difficult it is for companies to keep themselves secure, that they're effectively gladiators in this pit going against everyone out there, m malicious and hacktivists and all, all the like. Um, have you heard any theories or any proposals that are convincing for how companies can share their data potentially with one another to say we found this vulnerability, this is something perhaps to look for in your work and kind of help, help bridge that, that gap and help them unify? So what you're really talking about is information sharing. And I'm a huge proponent of fully open information sharing. I don't like all these little pockets of groups, government groups, or just financial services groups, where they share stuff amongst themselves. I think that's incredibly inefficient, right? The idea of DEF CON, the idea of bug track, were to make information sharing completely open. So I think we should have as open as, as possible, right, information sharing. I don't care if the adversaries get the information, too as long as the defenders work on that information, it's better. The problem with w open information sharing is the adversaries take advantage of it and the defenders don't. Yeah. If the defenders took advantage of it, it would be fine. So um, I'm all for as much open information sharing as we can have. Thank you. Anyone else for a question? Please feel free. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Do you think that yourself, um, other members of Loft, and other individuals in the early 90s and, and late 90s receive, uh, receive the reward and recognition that they should, given what they did for the security sector today? Um, and just for the record, I don't unless you convince me otherwise. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think, you know, I'm a pretty humble guy. I don't, I don't need any more reward. I've been very successful in my career. Uh, I've met a lot of great people. Um, I get to stand up here and talk with you and meet you, so um, I'm, I'm fine myself. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I need a, you know, a Presidential Medal of Honor or anything like that. Would the rest of the boss say that as well? Uh, some, of them, some of them probably would have a different answer, yeah. Uh, so really quick, what spaces do you think really need to be made nervous these days? Could, could you repeat the end? Yeah, sure. Uh, what places uh, or what uh, sectors do you think really need to be more, made more nervous these days? I, I missed the last part again. No problem. What places uh, or what sectors do you think really need, to get, really need to be made more nervous right now? Oh, okay. Yeah, I was missing the nervous, the nervous word. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I know the government is already nervous. Uh, I, think, I, I, think it's, I think it's the IoT sector. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're getting quite the feedback loop that they, that they need to. Um, I think that you know, people are just shipping products and ignoring things. I think the noise level has to be, has to be raised there. Um, you know, we saw the Mirai botnet um, was sort of a wake-up call. Uh, I don't think that changed uh, how people are manufacturing these inexpensive IoT devices that, you know, it might cause $50, cost $50, but it causes a wor world of hurt, you know? Um, sort of, it's sort of like, uh, you know, dumping your toxic waste in the swamp, right? Just because something is cheap doesn't, to do or make doesn't mean it doesn't have really bad consequences. So, yeah, let's make them nervous. Maybe one more? question absolutely welcome absolutely welcome hi Chris thanks for the talk uh, that's great talk I want to ask you sometimes when you get a software you want to reverse and uh, when, when you look at the agreement one of them is do not reverse engineer do you observe it uh, and sit on your hand or you just go ahead and do it anyway um, I would go and do it anyway. I think, um, you know, 
you can't ask for permission, right? They're not going to give you permission. Um, so I, 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 would, I would go ahead and, 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 and do it anyway. Um, you know, uh, as, a, as a company, it's something that I can't do at, 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 at work. I need to, I need to follow those uh, rules myself. But I don't think we would have gotten anywhere um, with, with making better products unless people did that. So again, that's along the lines of uh, making people angry. Can you share with us where WeldPond came from, or is that completely taboo? No, it's, I can share. It's actually a fairly boring story, but uh, quickly. Um, so uh, the first BBS I connected to, that um, it, it, it had a requirement. I think it was called The Works in, um, in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, Jason Scott was the, uh, the guy who does textfiles.com. Jason Scott, you probably all know, was the uh, sysop. Um, and uh, the, the BBS was set up that it said no real names. You can't use your real name on the BBS. You gotta put in, you gotta put in a fake name. So when I signed up for an account, um, I was like, oh, I just, I don't wanna spend time thinking of some cool name. Uh, you know, so all I did was I looked up above my desk and I had a map of the Boston area. And I just put my finger up there and I put my finger on Weld Pond, which is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a pond in Dedham, Massachusetts. And that's where I came up with the name. I didn't think I'd be using it 24 years later. Um, so that, that's, that's where it came from. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much. I, when we received this, when we received the CFP, we were like, oh my God. Um, you know, it's a tremendous honor for you to, to give the keynote here at the Packet Hacking Village and speaker workshops. Um, I cannot, personally, I cannot thank you enough for everything that you've done for not only uh, the community here, but also uh, for me personally and my career as well, too. And uh, I'm totally very, very grateful for that. So thank you for everything that you've done for, for the community and for, for me personally. And I also want to say a very special thank you to each and every one of you here who was at this talk. Um, just looking at this room right now, now this is my 11th DEF CON, and it really, really does feel like uh, going back to the old days when I first got, uh, when I got to a talk at Alexis, not Alexis Park, but at the Riviera. I mean, DEF CON talks, if you could believe, were the size were just as big. So just like going back to the old days. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Chris.